everybody. You are listening to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast, where we will be tackling real financial issues so women can eliminate fear and take charge of their lives. I am your host, Kimberly Davis, and I am the Fiscal Feminist. So let's get to it. I grew up watching my grandmother, who was in an abusive marriage. And it became so abusive that she ended up passing away. Mm. And I watched this growing up as a little girl, not being able to really understand. And I had a, you know, a life changing conversation with her before she died. And she shared that she felt financially trapped. And so for me, Kim, that's when my life took a complete 180 of what I thought my life was going to be to completely changing my major and moving from Michigan to Wall Street, New York City, a place I had never been before to learn about finance and eventually launch this nonprofit. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Fiscal Feminist Podcast. I'm super excited today to have my guest Stacy Francis with us today. She is an expert in a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I am Kimberly Davis, and I am also the Fiscal Feminist. I am a managing director and a partner in the Bonson Group, which is a wealth management firm in Newport Beach, California, with offices in New York, Nashville, Minnesota, and Portland, Oregon. Stacy Francis is with us today, and she is also a financial advisor and wealth manager, but she has a very distinct expertise in women, uh, focusing on women in transition, and she is quite an expert in the field. So, Stacy, thank you so much for joining me today to discuss these very important issues. Thank you for being here. I'm excited. Uh, you know, women and money, it's what gets me up, you know, in the morning. And there's so much work that we have to educate, empower. So I just feel very blessed to be here. Thank you, Kim. Well, I, you know, I heard you speak a few years ago at the IDFA Institute for Divorce Financial Analyst. Uh, I guess they have a convention. I don't know what to call it. You know, you every one, once a year, we all get together and uh, Stacy spoke at that. And um, I had just gotten my CDFA, which is the uh, certification for uh, divorce financial analysts. And I was so impressed with your speaking and you really motivated me. Um, I, at the time, uh, had not even had the Fiscal Feminist as a platform yet. And it it really kind of was a tipping point in the sense that I thought, you know, I want to be able to help women of all economic strata, not just the women that retain me as a wealth manager, but all women who are going through transition in some way because the effect of it throughout their entire life is quite significant. It's not just a one and done. It can literally affect them throughout their entire life. And as someone who did go through a transition that was not particularly fun and had kind of dire economic consequences for me, I kind of at that moment said, okay, I have my wealth management practice. It's very robust. Now I want to take this a little bit to the side and have another platform that reaches all women of all ages, millennials, uh, older women in transition, Gen Z. And I don't think enough people are talking about it. Now, Stacy has been talking about it. And um, she is the president and CEO of Francis Financial. And I believe that's in New York, correct? Yes, we are roots in New York, but we do work all over the country. Yes. Okay. And you have also written two books. The first book is on the divorce topic, and it's called Unveiling the Unspoken Truth, the Financial Challenges Women Face During and After Divorce. And the other book is Financial Help for Widows, a Complete Resource Guide. I'm assuming you can get these on Amazon. Um, so actually, they're not on Amazon. All you have to do, and I'll put the link in the show notes, um, it's actually free of charge. And so all you have to do is uh, click on that link. We'll send it to you, and you can do a online version, or we can send it via snail mail. It's all about just getting good resources into the hands of women. Oh, that's that's fantastic. I love that. And you also do a podcast called uh, the Financially Ever After Podcast. So check out all your podcast platforms for uh, Financially Ever After Podcast with Stacey Francis. And listen, I believe she's, you do it once uh, every other Tuesday. So stay tuned and look for that because that's going to give you a lot of in, uh, information on all these various topics. I, I know that you also have founded Savvy Ladies, which is a nonprofit. And again, 
that's in the interest of spreading the word and being an educational tool for women to go to? Yes. Um, I actually found it Savvy Ladies, if you can believe it, when I was 26. And you uh-huh. may wonder, you know, what would propel a 26-year-old to take on starting a nonprofit? But I grew up watching my grandmother, who was in an abusive marriage, and it became so abusive that she ended up passing away. Mm. And I watched this growing up as a little girl, um, not being able to really understand. And I had a you know, a life-changing conversation with her before she died. And she shared that she felt financially trapped. And so for me, Kim, that's when my life took a complete 180 of what I thought my life was going to be to completely changing my major and moving from Michigan to Wall Street, New York City, a place I had never been before, to learn about finance and eventually launch this nonprofit. And we've worked with tens and tens of thousands of women matching up with volunteer certified financial planners, certified divorce financial analysts to work one-on-one free of charge. And then we have hundreds of TED Talk-like videos and webinars that we host uh, both on our website at SavvyLadies.org as well as online. And it's, you know, it's my love letter to my grandmother. I, you know, grew up seeing one of the people who I most dearly, dearly love be hurt and felt helpless and felt guilty that I couldn't do something to make a difference. And so I know she's not judging me for that. I know that she's very happy that we're out there, that we're talking about financial empowerment for women. And there are a good number of women who come to Savvy Ladies who are in abusive relationships, whether it's financial abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, Um, And then we have women who come to Savvy Ladies who are just starting their first job out of college Mm -hmm. and, you know, navigating, do I pay off my student loans? Am I, you know, am I eligible to have some of my loans forgiven from, you know, the recent legislation passed to, um, you know, what can I do to save into my 401k? So that is a big part of who I am. And then I started Francis Financial the year after, uh, 20 years ago, actually, to pay for Savvy Ladies <laughs> because charities only can do as much good work as the amount of money they have. And so I knew I needed to make myself financially successful so that I could make the charity also successful and be able to do good work. And so here we are a few decades later, and um, I feel I feel really, really blessed to have these two amazing organizations um, doing this work. So if any of our listeners want to contact you through Savvy Ladies, they have an issue, they need help, they want some guidance, they just go on to SavvyLadies.org yeah. or is there a way to email, contact you or phone number or how do they get in touch? Yeah, so you can go right onto the SavvyLadies.org website and it's Savvy is spelled with two V's because I, I say it's very, very good. So it's SavvyLadies.org. <laughs> right on the homepage there, Kim, um, you can see uh, a request uh, to put out for our helpline. We've already made 1,500 matches between women seeking financial advice and help and our volunteer certified financial planners are ready just this year. And that number is going up by the hundreds um, every single month. Um, So it's a great resource. And then you can also see fantastic uh, topics of, you know, anything you would be interested in learning more about, whether it's college uh, funding, it might be divorce, it might be retirement planning and savings, it could be getting out of debt. And uh, there's, uh, again, hundreds of TED Talk like videos and articles for, for individuals. And we don't income test. So it can be, you know, anyone, whether you have a dollar in your pocket, or you don't have a dollar in your pocket, it's there as a as a resource. So do you have financial advisors who are contributing their time to help you answer all these questions? Who's answering the questions and how do they get involved? Because there could be some financial advisors, including myself, who might want to help out with this uh, endeavor. Uh, that's so sweet. Um Savvy ladies would not be able to do the work that we do, we do without our volunteer financial advisors. We have 150 financial advisors who volunteer their time, and uh, they uh, offer to 
work with one or two women each month. And that's an hour or two hours of their time. Um, It works really well because we work with women all over the U.S. And so it works out very well for our volunteers also to be in the different time zones of the United States. And we do have some who bless them. They'll work with five women a month, often they're, you know, in a different part of their career, maybe wrapping up their, you know, what they're doing in their practice. It's been wonderful, but we could not do this work. We could not do this work without the amazing financial experts that volunteer their time. And they're certified financial planners, as I mentioned, divorce experts, also debt management Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. experts, career counseling, you know, debt counseling, um, We even have financial therapists. And so, you know, depending on what you're dealing with, we have an expert that can work with you uh, free of charge for that one session. And the session typically lasts about an hour. I mean, it's up to you, Mm -hmm. um, but usually it's about an hour or so because we, we do find that often, and you probably find this in your practice too, Kim, someone comes to you with a, a burning topic that they they want to talk about, but then you realize there are all these other, you know, topics too, as you kind of, what they say, like peel away the, the, the the layers of the onion. onion. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think that's the thing is usually what they come to you about is the tip of the iceberg, right? So Mm -hmm. it's the problem at hand, but there are so many things that have led up to this, but for anyone who does want to be an advisor or get involved in this again, do they reach out to you through Savvy Ladies? Yep. Yeah, right through Savvy Ladies. And we have a link for um, if you are interested in the website. And you can also email me, Stacy, S-T-A-C-Y, at SavvyLadies.org. And that comes right to me, too. So happy to help. Well, I think it's awesome. And um, I'm going to put my name in the ring for that because it's right in my wheelhouse. And uh, I, you know, I really do. I am as I'm very passionate about it, like you are. Just before we get into the uh, you know granular aspects of the do's and the don'ts and the bigger picture of divorce and 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 hopefully we can even get into you know loss. When your grandmother was going through what sounds like a form of domestic abuse, but perhaps on the financial side, which is tantamount to domestic abuse. Period. If you could help her. With your experience now, why was she not able to extricate herself? And I know it's because through money, you know, that controls everything. People do not know how they're going to live if they cannot have access to money. And some people, you know, in relationships, it can really be tantamount to abuse. Given yourself today, what would you say to your grandmother then if you could have helped her out what would what advice would have you given her at that moment wow kim that's a very wise and insightful question so i was very young when she passed away i grew up with the abuse and really realized what the abuse was when i was a teenager and so that's when um i had this conversation shortly after and then in college i better understand now why she stayed, why she felt she couldn't leave. At the time, it was very foreign for me to to just understand why would you let someone hit you? Why would you stay in that type of an environment? But I also realize, and in working with quite a few domestic violence victims, they are often have gone down that path of abuse for so long, gaslighting, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. emotional abuse, um, not having access to the financials, not having access to that knowledge. You know, it's much easier to stand to the side as I did and judge and say, why do you, why do you stay? But when you're living through that and you yourself are the survivor, when you speak to these women, it's nearly impossible to leave in a lot of cases. Yeah, no, I think that's 100% correct. And it's easy to judge, but even family members, you're not there, you know, in the house. Uh, and it's it's like psychological, I don't know, it's like control psychologically. Exactly. You can't make decisions. 
Yeah, Kim, and, and you, you really hit the nail on the head that it's psychological control. It's also sometimes physical control. Mm-hmm. It's fiscal re- control as well. And it can become violent. And we've seen, you know, many times where emotional abuse and financial abuse turns violent. And when you look at the statistics out there, 98% of situations where there is physical abuse, there's also financial abuse. And it's all about the the aggressor's ability to control. And so if anyone who is listening that in even a small way wonders if there are traits in their relationship of, of physical, of emotional, or financial abuse, there's a reason why you are having those thoughts. Right. And make sure that you reach out to a professional. And I'll just share a story. A lovely woman who has dedicated her life to working with women, trying to leave and extricate themselves from an unhealthy marriage. It was emotional abuse. It was physical abuse. I'm sorry, emotional and, and financial abuse. And it turned physical and her children saw her after he, she had been strangled uh. and went unconscious. Uh. Thank goodness they were old enough to call the police. The police EMS came in and then arrested him, but often it escalates. And so while it may not have gone to that point in your relationship or someone that you know that you're concerned about, it can. And the times when a woman is most in danger is when she's trying to leave. Well, that's because the partner sees the control slipping away, right? And they don't want it. They don't want that to happen. So they're going to pull out all the stops. And there is, you know, statistics say, you know, a lot of domestic abuse ends in, you know, unfortunately in, in the death of one of the, you know, the partner who's being abused sometimes because it just escalates to the point of no return. And although this is a really heavy topic, it is a very important topic because I think maybe we don't speak about it that much. And that's why people don't want to admit to it or they don't seek help because there's a stigma that should not be there in any way, shape or form for the person that's the subject of the abuse. But I want to ask you a quick question, though. So your grandmother was of a certain generation. Do you think that things have changed and that women that it's better? I mean, you know, it's not as prevalent or is it the same amount? And maybe we have more resources so people aren't so reticent to reach out. Because back then, and I don't know how old your grandmother would be today, but I suspect even getting a divorce at that point had a stigma. Yeah, no, no, exactly. Well, we, you know, we're, we're definitely more comfortable divorcing, you know, and, and, and yes. that, you know, I don't think is a bad thing necessarily. But You know, it's interesting because this is a myth that, you know, the older generations, um, women were less involved with the finances than they are today. And that is not necessarily the case. And there was a study that was put out and I'll, I'll make sure I send it to you for your your show notes so that you have a link to it. Mm -hmm. And it interviewed married women. Now I want to do say married women of all different generations. And so millennials, Gen X, baby boomers, and the generation that had the least involvement in the finances of their marriage of all three of those different uh, age groups were the youngest millennial women. Wow. That's really interesting. And I have to tell you, Kim, <laughs> That's... I have read this study over and over again because it felt like a kick to my gut. Yeah. You know, what we've learned from our years and, you know, what I know about finances now that I wished I knew back when I was a millennial. So there's a lot of work to be done. And I, you know, work on dozens of divorce cases every year. And I've 
you know, worked in the area of divorce now for 20 years. So I've really seen over the last two decades, have things gotten better? And do my younger clients have more of a grasp and um, agency over the money in the marriage compared to our clients who might be in their 50s and 60s? And the answer is no. I see it similar across the board that uh, once women particularly are married, and especially if they have children, we essentially divide and conquer. And there's nothing wrong with that. But often the dividing and conquer of all the tasks and things that need to be done Mm -hmm. is that, you know, he's managing certain things, which often is the investing, long-term financial planning, working with the CPA and the accounting. She often is doing the bill paying, which is great. And that is important. But that's not managing the money. That's not, you know, that's... Exactly. It's not managing the money. I write about this in my book and I talk about it all the time. In a strange way, I feel like we've kind of gone backwards and I am a big uh, promoter and I talk a lot about prenups because I found that a lot of people think that the only time you need a prenup is if you're rich or you're, you know, you have this, you come from a rich family, big inheritance, all that. That is not true because you're not a static human being. So you know, my daughter's getting married in October, and um, she's a lawyer in New York City. And part of my trust document requires all of my children to have a prenup or a postnup if they want to inherit any of money that I have going to leave them. But more importantly, she and I spoke about it, forgetting that, that it was really important because she makes, you know, a lot of money for her age. And even if uh, and she and her husband both do well, but she... Uh, makes a you know more than he does, but I wanted her, there to be provisions within that prenup of what happens when she steps out or she reduces her work. So I've come up with a formula that is now being put into this prenup, and I'm talking about a, a lot out in the great wide world, which is, you know, you're not going to contribute to your 401k, you're not going to contribute to social security, you're going to take a hit on career development, and you're not going to get paid for invisible labor. So how do we how do we quantify that in a prenup so that there's at least a base amount that you're going to get, and you're not going to leave it to a, a judge to randomly decide who may or may not value any of that. But I find when I even mention this to millennials or to younger people, you know, there's this kind of, they recoil. You know, it's like, oh, my God, you know, that's so unromantic. Well, yeah, maybe, but not really. If you really love each other, you should be able to talk about it um, and be transparent. But if in 20 years or 10 years this happens to you, you will be very thankful that you took some proactive steps. And I understand, I think what you're saying about the division of labor is very interesting. In my book, I did a lot of research on this and, you know, 70% of all caregiving, whether it's to parents or children or whatever, household stuff, taken care of by women, even when they're the primary breadwinners. And so why is that? Um, Somebody I met last week, I want to watch this. um, I don't know. It's on a number of different streaming platforms, but it was called Fair Play. And she was one of the people in the couples that they follow because she said, you know, her and her husband just cannot seem to get this division of labor right. Um, and they both work, mm-hmm. and she still does most of it. And so they actually have a, a documentary on this that I do want to watch. So I'll let you guys all know what I think of it after I watch it. But I don't understand why the message didn't get stronger over the years. And maybe you can give some insight into this. And now it just seems so watered down. And I don't know if any progress has really been made. Like, it's kind of back to the 1950s, you know. Well, you know, it is, it definitely is a uphill battle and there's a lot of history and, you know, beliefs about roles and uh, out there. And yes, we've made, I think, some progress, but, uh, you know, there's still a lot, a lot more to go. And I really bring it back to the way we were raised. I'm, I'm a mom and with my children, we talk about money all the time. They know exactly how much I make. They know how much our house costs. They know how much our vacation costs. They know how much, you know, we need to save for going and doing X, Y, and Z. You know, not not to frighten them. It's not that, but just letting them know, you know, what it takes to live our lifestyle. And we live in New York City and it's a, you know, a really beautiful apartment that doesn't drop down from the sky. I mean, not that this is a normal day, but I worked 18 hours yesterday. And so the kids, they totally see 
how hard I work to be able to provide for them. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they understand money and we talk about investing and they have their own investment accounts and um, they have their own credit card and they're 16 and 13 really learning the fundamentals of money early on. And we talk about it, but Kim, that's not normal. That's not the typical upbringing that we see uh, today, nor, you know, 10, 15 or 20 years ago. So I truly believe that it starts at home. And there's a great resource for all your listeners, because I truly understand from a lot of our clients, they feel a little nervous talking about money to their children because they themselves are still on their learning journey. Mm -hmm. But there is a great book um, called The Opposite of Spoiled. And anyone who has children, whether they are elementary, they are young adults, they are um, teenagers, It is a fantastic book. It's by um, Ron Lieber, and he's a New York Times contributor and and journalist. It's a life-changing book, and it teaches you how to, number one, raise your children to be happy, healthy, productive members of society and valuing the, you know, the the importance of money, but, but also understanding you know, that money isn't everything. Right. Understanding how money fits into your happiness equation, right? Yeah. And I I know with our clients, particularly through Francis Financial, you know, our clients have significant resources. Our typical client is has three million, four million, five million dollars, and their children have a very I will just say a luxurious lifestyle. It was not the lifestyle I grew up with. And they struggle with how do I teach them these you know, these really important values. And so this book, I will tell you, it's just, it's a fascinating read. I've read it numerous times because every time I read it, I get another another nugget from it to hopefully be able to impart to to my children. So so we'll see. I mean, the you know, I, I probably talk to my children. I might be on the more extreme end of how much they know about the finances, but I would rather be on that end than not having those really important conversations. I agree with you. And I, you know, my children are older. They're in their late 20s, uh, early 30s. And I think if I had to do it all over again, I would be a little bit uh, more granular uh, in my conveying to them certain financial things. You know, I went through a divorce when they were older. My one daughter was about was going to Georgetown and the other two were in high school. But in retrospect, I think I tried to make up for the disruption of the divorce by shielding them from all of the stuff I was going through that was really devastating and just paralyzed me with fear for many years. I think now we all understand what happened because we've talked about it since, but I think it would have been better for everyone if I had been a lot more open and transparent and not trying to kind of... I don't know, make up for the fact that we, I was, you know, we were getting a divorce and, and nobody was very happy about it. And, and so let's segue because that's a great way to get into what you are doing. By the way, I think it's just awesome that you have this 501c3. And I worked, uh, I didn't work 18 hours yesterday, but I worked about 12, 13 hours yesterday. So I don't know whether we just picked the wrong profession or, or <laughs> we're just too busy, but we cannot keep that kind of schedule up. Yeah, no, I know. As, especially as I get older, you're right. <laughs> it's just, you feel it more. It's crazy. But let me ask you first, how is the financial advice that you give to people in situations of divorce or loss different than, say, what other financial advisors are doing in non-divorce or loss situations? Yeah. So, I mean, number one, um, it's quite high stakes mm-hmm. for, you know, both of these women who is starting the divorce process or going through or, you know, a woman whose husband has just passed away. You're making decisions about your life that are going to impact you for the rest of your years. Yeah. Forever. And, you know, it's, it's very scary, the statistics that you see, but the, the population, um, high, the the largest population above age 65, uh, living in poverty 
are divorced women. And the second largest population are women who have been married, have been married and their, their spouse has passed away. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a high stakes time. And the most important things you can do is to not look at each issue in a vacuum, but to look at your comprehensive financial plan. A lot of advisors are really good at investing and creating robust portfolios. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be in business if they, if they weren't. And so that's, you know, I don't want to say it's a layup to find a, an advisor who could do that work for you, but it's a lot easier. I agree. But what someone needs to be looking for is, uh, in addition to that, not and or, but an, in addition, someone that can model out that settlement proposal A versus B, C, taking into account tax impact, mm -hmm. growth potential of different assets, risk, and run all the different scenarios for you during the divorce and truly understand the important factors and work hand in hand with your matrimony attorney or, or mediator. And can I ask you a quick question? Because whether you're doing, a, I guess, a mediated divorce or a collaborative divorce or a litigated divorce, do you find that you get pushback from the attorney that they don't want a you know, an an, a certified divorce financial analyst involved? Or are they more likely to be happy that you're on board? Because I know for a fact that, you know, I was a lawyer for many years. I was a corporate securities lawyer, but I, and I also, well, I got divorced in England, so I had a solicitor and a barrister, but I'm not sure that, you know, the business aspects of the financial aspects was really their strong point in certain things, you know, I mean, yeah. uh, so how do people, how are the other professionals reacting in, to your participation in this? Great question. Yeah. And I hear from lawyers themselves that they, they didn't go to law school because they like numbers necessarily. Right. So often um, the, the financial piece is not necessarily their strong suit. I have no problem dealing, you know, with lawyers. In fact, um, a huge amount of our business is referrals from lawyers where it's, um, you know, particularly when the work that we come in is a really high asset complex case where there might be restricted stock units, mm -hmm. there might be mm -hmm. deferred compensation, um, private equity, hedge funds, commercial real estate. So that's where I would say we shine is where it's really complicated and they need that person to essentially unravel the tangled ball of yarn. Right. Um, that being said, you know, I've, I was one of the first people to get the CDFA. And so my journey to to be in this place of real comfort of working hand in hand with attorneys, I, I'm going to be really honest, it has not always been that way. Kim, it took me years and years and years to prove my value and that I could make the process move more smoothly, less legal fees, and a better and outcome. And a better outcome. Right. Yeah. And a, a better outcome for their client, which made them look really good. They got more referrals from their client going forward. But it it's an emerging profession. You know, I would say where the CFP and, and financial planning industry is, is uh, you know, or was 30 years ago is, is kind of where we're at right now as certified divorce financial analysts. So it's quite unique. I mean, you don't find many people who are working on you know, 20, 30 matrimonial cases a year. Your typical CDFA, certified divorce financial analyst, uh, financial advisors working on one, two, or three cases. Mm -hmm. So we're a little different, um, but we've, you know, really leaned into that and knock on wood, been able to make our name for ourselves. So it's not, it's not as hard for a lawyer that hasn't worked with us in the past to be able to accept us. There are some. There are some that really don't want to work with other professionals. Right. And they um, might be more billing focused and really wanting to make sure that all those billable hours stay in house. Yeah. Yeah. But the, but, yeah, but the vast majority I find um, are not that way. And you usually figure out who those people are. And often, you know, they have clients that if they do hire them because of their name, they're usually either not happy or they fire them. And one of the things we did um, in that book that I told you about unveiling the unspoken truth, mm -hmm. 
you know, really interviewing uh, women. We interviewed 150 women who had gone through divorce and asked them, what would you tell your closest girlfriend of you, what you did right and what you did wrong? And it was interesting because almost half of them said that they would not refer their matrimonial attorney. Interesting. Now, granted, at the end of a divorce, you, you kind of want both parties to feel a little unhappy that they both gave and they both, you know, really um, compromised. I don't think anyone walks away from the settlement no, table. It's very um, unusual. You know, cheering, yeah. Right. Cheering and doing lamps. So, so I understand why that number is low, but you know, the good attorneys out there are bringing in the right experts, whether it's a forensic accountant for finding assets, or it's a appraiser that does a fantastic job of, you know, figuring out in this very volatile, fast moving Mm -hmm. real estate market what the real value of the marital home is. They're bringing those professionals in to do a bang up, amazing job for their clients. So that's typically what I see. But, but yeah, and, you know, you as a consumer can hire a CDFA, or your matrimony attorney may uh, approach you about that. And usually the person who most benefits from working with a CDFA is someone who has not been in the driver's seat of the finances Mm -hmm. because they enter into that divorce behind the eight ball and their spouse, if they have greater expertise, can run circles around them. Yes. And, you know, I've seen that where she's divorcing the hedge fund manager, the financial advisor, the CPA, the, you know, corporate business attorney that has a real strong handle on financial, you know, aspects of their their marriage and just in general, you know, financial wherewithal. And, you know, it's a lot to catch up and learn, let alone you're going through the separation of... Yeah, then you're dealing with the emotional aspect of your marriage. But what is the first most important thing that you can share with someone who is absolutely wants to get divorced and is considering filing for divorce or telling the person they're ready to get a divorce, their other uh, half? What is the first thing they should do to make sure that this is all going to go according to plan or not go totally awry? Yeah, um, and it's a great it's a great question. So if you're contemplating divorce, um, don't you know end up yelling, "I'm going to divorce you," and I'm going to move fight. out tonight like, and leave the house. Yeah, exactly. Um, as hard as that is, put yourself first, and that's really what you're doing. Put yourself first and get your team in order. So start to to interview matrimonial attorneys because um, most likely the first matrimonial attorney is not going to be your ideal fit. Just as you know, we you know. You went on many dates, I'm, and, and I imagine that your husband is not, you know, the only date that you've had in your life, right? Hope, hopefully, hopefully not, because you would not, have, not. You would have had a very boring life. <laughs> yes, and so um, interview those attorneys. The great thing about interviewing attorneys is that you then conflict them out of working with your spouse. Right. If they've spoken to you for an initial consultation, um, you've conflicted them out. So um, interview the best attorneys out there. And on that note, just. Maybe you might address the fact that some people, if they do tell their spouse and their spouse is a CEO or is a big deal, they will actually purposely conflict out the attorneys by because they are very savvy. So if you could just have a just quick word on that. Yeah. So um, when you are meeting with attorneys, um, you know, you now have conflicted them out from working with your spouse. And so we, we do have clients that they make it a side job to to be to interview the best attorneys in the tri-state area here in New York. I mean, to be honest, I think that's not a very good use of your time. You know, interview at least three, pick the best one. I mean, maybe you need to, to interview more. If you are you know, interested in working with a CDFA, talk to a few certified divorce financial analysts as well. We're all unique and different. You know, for me, I tend to do like really complex, you know, meaty things. And then there are other people that are much better at dealing with, you know, debt in the marriage, credit issues, Mm -hmm. things like that. So finding that team is really important. And then the third thing is, this sounds really negative, but it, I'm going to be a realist and it does happen that, you know, you say you want a divorce and then all of a sudden there's a movement of assets 
outside of the marital pot. And if you're not in tune with what those assets are, it can be phenomenally expensive, number one, to find them. Mm -hmm. And uh, you may actually not be able to do so. So um, making sure that the third thing that you're doing, in addition to putting your team in place with a uh, attorney, a CDFA, is to get a recent statement of any single thing in your life that has a dollar sign associated with that. And so that means taxable accounts, bank accounts, checking accounts, 401ks, IRAs, any compensation, tax returns, any compensation at work. So 401ks, TDAs, 403bs, um, you know, employee uh, purchase plans, deferred compensation, restricted stock plans, uh, restricted stock units. There's a huge list. Um, And actually in the book I mentioned, um, Unveiling the Unspoken Truth, I have an entire list there that you can just click off. Got that, got that, got that, got that. Because your process will be faster, more seamless, and cost less money because you're going to go in having all the information you need, not having to, like you said, you know, pull, you know, teeth. You really do want to have as much information as possible. So, okay, so they've gotten all their information. Who should be on their team? So there's actually a great section in there about your team. And it's interesting because you have the the people you would think, right? A a matrimonial attorney, you have a a financial advisor, could be your advisor, although they cannot advise you through the divorce of what assets to take. So just knowing that, but they can help educate you about the assets you do have, or you can get an outside CDFA uh, to help you through the divorce. And then the person that you may not think about is actually a therapist or a divorce coach. Um, you know, as you know, this is this is not a sprint. It's a marathon. You know, many people, they start the process. They think, is this going to, ask me, is this going to take six months? No. I mean, on average, according to NOLO, the average divorce is 12 to 18 months, um, at least in the divorces that I'm part of. Maybe it's because there are children involved. There are significant assets. You know, for us, it's typically two years Mine was mine was three years. It was a good divorce that kept yeah. on giving. I mean, it was, you know, fascinating. I know. And so, you know, so many women I see that compromise just to get out of the relationship because it's so painful. And I, I think about it, you know, after you've just gotten like a big cut, that, that stinging and how you just want it to stop. You know, but as you know, like feeling that ongoing. No, um, it, it so, just it wears uh, you. It wears you down, and it gets to the point where you, the other party, knows it's wearing you down. So they want to wear you down more, so you'll just stop, um, and you'll give up. And also, you're incurring legal fees, and it's becoming expensive, and it's just this whole snowball of things. And it can be it just it it, can, it it is one of the hardest things I've ever gone through in my life, just because it was exhausting. I was so exhausted by the end of it. And, you know, after it was over, people said to me like a year later, wow, your face looks totally different. Uh, Because I think for four years, I just looked so sad, angry, some weird combination of all of those things. Um, And it is it is very, very difficult. I mean, I know that we've talked a lot about a lot of things, and I hate to put you on the spot, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, if there's one piece of advice that you could give to somebody who's about to start this journey that can be very unpleasant and um, very emotional and trying, what is the most important thing that they can do from the get-go when they're about to start the whole divorce thing? Yeah, Kim, um, number one, get your team in place. Really important. Um, You need to make sure you have the right professionals around you to to get through this process as healthy as whole and financially secure as possible. And secondly, use this as an opportunity to really get your hands around your finances. Knowing about your money is not a nice to have, it's a must have. And so this is a great opportunity for you to do just that. And I think for everybody out there who's listening, whether you're going to get a divorce or thinking about a divorce or not even in the realm of having a divorce, because maybe you're not even married, is you need to know about your money. I don't care what age you are. Women need to take control of their finances. They, even if they are not the primary breadwinners, they still are stakeholders in their relationships. Even if they are busy like I was, uh, this is a very bad thing because 
all the stuff that you think you're doing for your kids or whatever by being busy, the most important thing you can do for them is understand what's going on in your financial world because at some point that might affect you and them in a negative way if you don't. And I would like to add one other thing. I wish I had had a therapist on my team. Uh, it probably, I did have a therapist, but, you know, she was uh, kind of, I, I couldn't afford her after a while because I was so busy paying my legal fees. But it would have been very helpful throughout all of it if I had had one. But in the end, as gnarly as that experience was, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. It caused a rebirth in my life. I took control of my finances after that because necessity required me to do it. I went into the financial advisory business, which has now provided me with, you know, the money I have to live and hopefully go into retirement with dignity. And it's inspired me with passion to talk to women so that they don't make the same mistakes that I, that I've made. And I think I want to thank Stacey Francis because she is an expert. She has really given back to women with her charitable organization, Savvy Ladies. I would encourage everyone who needs some help to check that out, to buy the books. This is all going to be in the show notes. I can't thank you enough for sharing your time today with us. I mean, you're awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for listening today to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast. Please take a minute to subscribe to the podcast on your preferred podcast platform. And I would really appreciate if you could also rate and review it. You can also find me on Instagram and TikTok at The Fiscal Feminist or check out the website, fiscalfeminist.com. 